Continuing on in Herbert Schlossberg's book, Idols for Destruction, we move into the first chapter entitled Idols of History. Since the German Oswald Spangler's book, Decline of the West, was published in the early 20th century, the historicist view of history is taken um, certainly on it's taken new forms um, quite a bit. One thing Spangler did not take into account himself was that man's view of history is dependent upon his view of time itself. In any and everyone's view of time is philosophical, but more importantly, religious in nature. One cannot hold a view of time without it being religious. And what Spangler did not realize is that there are many very conce concepts regarding time and man's relation to it. Man has uh, conceptualized time typically in a linear or cyclical fashion. From the West perspective, time is linear. With its Christian underpinning of the beginning in Genesis to the end in Revelation. When we travel east, or eastern in thought at least, we tend to find a more cyclical interpretation to the historical process itself. We have all heard that history repeats itself, right? Or the expression often attributed to uh, Mark Twain, that history does not repeat itself, but is often, it often rhymes. Somewhat, this, it, that's a reflection of that eastern mindset infiltrating the western world itself. Now, this is where we have to stop and think deeply about this, though, because as Herbert Butterfield has stated, our interpretation of the human drama throughout the ages rests finally on our interpretation of our most private experiences in life and stands as merely an extension to it. So what's meant by that, that statement? Well, sometimes the negative picture helps us illustrate that, right? So the classical view of history sees the particularities, those private experiences, as Butterfield mentions, as non-essential to the broader picture itself. Because history is viewed in a cyclical sense, it is not dependent upon the individual or his or her experience. In a way, because it is part of the grand cycle, it, whatever it is, whether it is an age in the past, present, or future, or a class, or a trend of history, history itself is bounding towards that goal with or without individuals. This mirrors the Eastern Buddhistic view towards time itself, which states that the unity of all things together negates the need to focus on the individual parts. Hence why G.K. Chesterton so aptly put it, it is fitting that the Buddha be pictured with his eyes closed. There's nothing to see. So what does that symbolize? Life's experience, they, they hold no weight, no importance to the historicist, the Buddhist. Because the universe, which we hear so much of today, or you know, the universe will tell me, or history itself, is bigger than you and ultimately cares nothing for you or what you're going through. It's like looking at a picture but ignoring the individual lines and, and shapes that were compiled together to create the illustration. In a sense, it assumes that the picture made itself. As Schlossberg notes... This is the epitome of idolatry, though. For this thought process places the entire meaning of life within the historical process. This is also known as imminence or being imminent. That's going to be an important word for you to remember because it's basically, it basically defines what historicists believe, which is that history within itself contains everything. And there's nothing outside of that, that time, that timeline, that history itself, that, that entity, if you will, that influences it. There, meaning there's no God that has any play in time. And history simply is. In other words, time is God. As we proceed here, what that specifically means is what we hope to discover. And this is where we get into some of the origins of modern-day historicist belief. So we'll try to simplify Schlossberg's point in all of this. So the German philosopher Hegel brought about the system of duality 
And in layman's terms, he saw basically real factual events versus the values or reasons behind those events. Historical events take place, which we understand to be facts. In Hegel and Karl Popper's view, the reason for those facts is the value it is measured by. And so the measurement of values is also the progression of reason in the historical process as a whole. So let's put that into more, I guess, of a succinct statement. As Schlossberg says, everything is fact, but some facts are values. So this is an important point, right? Because it, it, and it's illustrated by Woodrow Wilson in the modern era, who believe that law must be adjusted to fit the facts. Walter Lippmann also believed essentially the same thing when he said that laws must be changed to fit the sentiment or opinion of the day. So here's relativism at play in its most dangerous form, right? For the fact of history can be changed, and subsequently the laws with it, well, it's not a stretch to see how this becomes deadly very quickly. You see, the value of something changes over time, right, naturally. Take gold, for example. Its perceived value has changed from day to day for millennia. Sentiments, which are merely opinions, equally change over time. And therefore, the value or sentiment of something changes, so do the laws with it, and the people who are governed by those ever-changing laws suffer the consequences in this, co in this case, right? So, say our previous generation, for example valued the elderly uh, very highly and enacts laws to protect them, right? Those laws were based from the historicist mindset on the sentiment of the day. However, say that even the very next generation does not value the elderly, but rather sees them as, uh, as our generation does, simply as a nuisance and a consumer of, uh, say, vital resources. Well, the solution's simple. Change the laws in order to fit the opinion of the day, and you end up with the final solution. Hegel was a supreme sorcerer. He was a master of alchemy. Alchemy was the pseudoscience of changing a metal, say copper, into gold through various chemical reactions. Though Hegel was a spiritual alchemist, in that he was able to change the minds of men from one thing to another, not necessarily gold, his doctrine was a powerful influence in the world in that he saw particular facts as not necessarily being real, but only taking on meaning if they related to the overarching framework of the historical progress of history. In this paradigm, individuals lose all significance. And are merely, they're just fuel for the progress of history, as Schlossberg states. This process of dehumanization is what led to the powerful Marxist doctrine that is still so pervasive, even in today's society. And here's the deal. Here's what most people do not understand. They don't understand that this, what we're talking about right now, is the basis of communist Marxist thought. It's the very, it is the underpinning of Marxist thought. It's an idolatrous reliance on a false god. And that false god's name is fate or destiny. We are all quite familiar with these terms today, especially in our day and age. They are used uh, quite flippantly, I'd say, and even at ad nauseum in media and entertainment. But when we understand that the utilization of history and the events that occur within it become a means of justifying progress in whatever form it takes... We begin to see what type of God this really is, though, th through the disciples of fate itself. A and history is full of the disciples of fate, especially in the 20th and the 21st century. The disciples of history, uh, fate, rely on both the imminency and the inevitability of history itself. These have become known as uh, the progressives of our day. You've probably heard that term. In their view, uh, history will progress because it must progress. And whatever progresses to, it is right because that is what it is. It is it's what happened, right? So therefore, it must be, it must be right. It must be what uh, had to happen, basically. So whatever the most recent trend is, it must be a part of the historical process itself. 
It's just a part of it. It's imminent. All of the facts and events of history become subjective, though, to the progressive and can be used in any way, shape, or form that he or she feels necessary to further the current trend. You ever heard of the, you know, the term, uh, we must be on the right side of history? Now, here's a perfect example of how our language has been hijacked by idolatrous beliefs, and we simply assume it to be correct because it sounds good. To be on the right side of history, though, implies that there is a wrong side of history, right? So this begs the question, of course, as to who is the arbiter that says which is right and which is wrong? In the historicist view, there is no judge of the universe to help man make that discernment. In their world, he who holds the power of the current day thus becomes the decider of the fate of all men. So folks, this is idolatry at its finest and most sophisticated form as it reshapes the minds of men's, you know, of mankind in ways that, that they can't even comprehend. Most historians today are taught along these lines. If individual events lose their value, what's the point in learning about the historical facts at all? Why do we, why do we have social studies? Why do we have history in, you know, the, the universities or high schools or elementary school even? History itself loses its purpose in terms of the lessons it might teach us. Now, most historians will not necessarily subscribe to the view that, you know, history doesn't provide lessons to be learned, but they will always confuse the lessons by misapprehending the causes and the effects. Take, for example, the doctrine of multiple causation, which states that there are always numerous reasons why events take place. Yeah, there are economic reasons, political reasons, social reasons, all working together. The prophets of the, Vi the Bible would, uh, they would disagree with this thesis, though, right? For example, as Schlossberg points out, the kingdom of God that was basically the kingdom of God that was supposed to find its manifestation through the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel, right? Let's take Judah, for example, right? The kingdom of God, or rather Judah, was not taken into Babylonian captivity due to its economic situation or political environment or even the social issues of its day. The reason was wickedness, idolatry, lawlessness. So any of the political, economic, or social issues that, say, Judah or even Israel faced, therefore, were merely effects of that sin, that original cause. They weren't the cause. The, the political, the economic, th those were... They, they had those issues, no doubt, but they were not the cause. They were the effect. By misunderstanding the ultimate cause of humanity's problems as a whole, the progressive is unable to learn from history and is thus doomed to repeat it. Ironically, this would lend credence to the cyclical view of history, it would seem, because there's, you know, just repeated events after repeated events. But let's hold that thought, though. Because as we continue into the Christian's view of time now, the meaning behind history will hopefully become clearer and the dangers of worshiping fate more lucid to us. For most modern people, history is just, well, they say, right, just one damn thing after another. It's just a series of, infinite series of cyclical events that are completely random and ultimately, you know, coincidental but it must mean something, right? And therefore, we can assign any meaning we want to regarding the events of our lives, though ultimately fate will have its way always, with or without us. That's kind of the modern man's view. Christianity believes differently. History, as Schlossberg states, is a moral arena. For most modern people, history is just one damn thing after another, right? <laughs> it's an infinite series of cyclical events that are completely random and ultimately coincidental. But it, it must mean something, right? Therefore, for the progressive or the modern man's viewpoint, we can just assign any meaning we want to regarding to the, the events of our lives and ultimately history itself. And fate will have its way with us or it won't. We're either a part of it or we aren't. That's the modern man's interpretation, generally. But Christianity believes differently. History, as Schlossberg states, is a moral arena. 
it, it's not a time. It, it it doesn't have a timeless beginning with the universe birthing itself into existence, and nor will we f- find that that same universe depleted of its resources, being sucked into a black hole of despair and destruction at the very end. No, history is in the hands of a divine being who influences his creation in its smallest and most detailed manner. Therefore, everything between the beginning and the end is an integral part of that story. And Schlossberg gives us five points as to why believing in a lord of history dethrones the view of history as lord. The first point is, you know, here's these five points here. First, history is distinguished from nature, implying that man, as the main actors in history, are distinguished from nature itself, and they're not, therefore, animals or machines. Number two, it it gives back meaning to the events within history, which historicists deny, thus they mystify the, the present and the future by denying the past. Number three, it allows us to keep the means and the ends in their proper perspective. As Schlossberg states, subordinating subordinating the former to the latter. Uh, A common term of the progressive is the medium is the message. So, like, you know, from their view, if the revolution is both the means and the message, the issue becomes that of an ever-changing status quo, which leads to no particular end and becomes a moving target. So seeing a God beyond history provides reason to care for the ends, the message, and the, the end product, essentially. By having, number four, by having a solid focal point outside of time, it provides an unchanging reference against the ever-changing landscape of history itself, which helps to explain the otherwise unexplainable. And five, we have a principal value to weigh against all other values, and those values thus become unchangeable. So God intervenes in history. This is an undeniable fact for Christians. But not only does God intervene, he entered into time itself through the person of his son, Jesus Christ, and changed the very course of history by doing so. He continued to intervene through his apostles by his spirit, giving Paul a vision, say, for example, of taking the gospel to Macedonia. And thus, with no influence from history, civilization, or society itself, the world over was changed by a vision from a different dimension completely outside of time. This is how God works and continues to work through his people in particular, even to this very day. It is by maintaining these views that we are able to resist the historicist thought process of inevitability and fatalism from creeping into our own doctrine. Many have failed, or they really just fallen prey to the passivity that fatalism brings with it believing that God's plan will simply come to pass, because history will progress as it always has towards his desired end. Though the end of human progress, prophetically speaking, is rebellious decay towards the grave, not an ever-increasing trend of obedience that leads upwards towards righteousness and heaven. No, it, it, we've got to understand that our Part of in that plan of God is it's contingent upon our sanctification in the time that we are alive. We are presented in time with an opportunity to to be what Scripture calls the remnant of God's chosen ones, and this requires active submission to His will during time. The movement and trends of man seeking to, you know, really seeking the submission of the willing masses, uh, and that's evidenced by the lessons of history itself, these things are ever-changing. The power of the world and the institutions who hold that power are shifting hands endlessly on the stage of history. However, the Christian, by having an unchanging Lord outside of time, is able to ensure that he or she is not caught up in that changing landscape of morality. In other words, if the sentiments and the opinions of the world and its leaders change, the Christian is, it's not, he's not obligated to change with those, those changing norms because they serve a higher power who is their judge and indeed really the, the judge of all. Those who worship time relativize judgment, though. 
meaning all individuals, movements, classes, whatever they may be, they serve only to bring about the desired end of the current trend of history. The historicist sees history as a seamless web of interconnected events that are smoothly leading to the next event through never-ending cycles of cause and effect, uh, you know, all based on, on imminence, imminency. You know, you got to remember, you know, imminency means that the history is the whole show. Once again, there's, there's no outside influence affecting it. So it's seamless. It's all working so smoothly. But once that apex is reached, all else, as Karl Marx states, is thrown into the trash can of history. You know, so hence, you know, Marx seeing human relationships dictated, you know, primarily from an economic basis, saw capitalism's place in the trash in order to bring about socialism, the, ne the next phase of historical process. And as Schlossberg points out, historicists end up throwing basically everything into the trash can as they're always moving towards, you know, some mystical something that never finds its place within actual reality. For Marx, it was the proletariat millennium, a utopia, right, of the working class. Uh, for Hitler, it was the Third Reich, the thousand-year himself, you know, looking for the thousand-year Aryan race manifested on Earth. But what the likes of communists and fascists and other theologies that worship time are incapable of comprehending is catastrophe. The unexpected catastrophic events that literally destroy the plans of man and reroute his path, it's something that baffles the historicist minds, mindset itself. How could this disaster have come about, they may say. There was no economic, political, social, geological cause for this. And so the framework and paradigm of the worship of fate is destroyed by catastrophes, also known in the Christian mindset as the judgments of God. Whether it be Babylon, Tyre, or even Israel and Judah, God's chosen people say, the cause of unexpected disaster on nations is rooted in rebellion towards the Creator Himself. And through the prophets of God, even the most minuscule of events carries with it weight and meaning. And the meaning of any huge event, like a catastrophe, is never without purpose. It is judgment. Though the judgments of God have they've come to be known as only an expression of his wrath for vengeance sake, that's a severe misconception, though. God's judgments were always in response to sin. And we're always corrective in nature as a father disciplines his son. Therefore, mercy triumphs over judgment in history. Though his mercy is perceivably, perceivably delayed uh, as we see one catastrophe after another occur, it's for the Christian to exercise patience in an age of impatience and wait to see his mercy come, for it will. The progressive worshiper of fate seeking to further the sentiment of the day into the next phase of historical process, like, say, Marx, Lenin, or Stalin, will do whatever is necessary to accomplish their most immediate goal. Theirs is an exercise in impatient futility, though. These servants of fate do not realize that they are vessels for destruction and wrath in this age. There are vessels of mercy, and there are vessels of wrath as Paul states in Romans. And time does not distinguish between the two. Rather, Yahweh, the creator of history, who sent his son into time to split it in two from B.C. to A.D., saw to it that his church would stand as a watchman on the wall, crying out against the idolatrous worship of fate and destiny. And by their cry, distinguishes between their cry, you know, distinguishes between the vessels of mercy and destruction. Those who heed the call of God's mercy and repent of their idolatry will find that, that grace of God extended to even their most private and intimate aspects of life. For God cares about the means and the ends, the private and the public, the individual and the collective, the past the present, and the future. But the worship of fate is the worship of one's own destruction. And any desire to progress the historical trends of man's own workmanship, right, 
is the ulti- it's ultimately the hastening of one's own destruction. Time will betray those who worship it. And that warning will be written in the annals of history for all to read. <laughs>